Heavy metals such as lead are toxic to human beings, and there is no safe level for them. Recent research has shown that users of marijuana have higher levels of lead and cadmium than non-users. Are state medical marijuana programs doing anything about this? Let's talk about it. Hey everybody, it's Dr. David. Hope you're having a good day, a good start to your summer. Um, as you may know, I'm a board certified pediatrician in Tampa. I'm the founder, I'm the medical director for holistic pediatrics and family care, a family um, practice here, as well as for holistic relief, a family medical cannabis clinic as well. Um, you know, I do treat people for all ages on both sides of those really functioning, focusing on functional medicine. And of course, part of that is understanding the wonderful properties of medical cannabis in terms of being anti-inflammatory, um, in terms of helping with moods, disorders, all types of things like that. Um, but also a main part of my practice um, in this channel is also educating people um, on things on how to make themselves healthy when it comes to clean food, clean air, um, and other products as well. So... Um, of course, if anybody's interested, of course, feel free to hit us up if you uh, either want an educational consultation if you're out of state or if you're in state and you want to be a practice, uh, a patient of mine or my practice to uh, handle those types of things with the more the merrier. Come on board. Um, now, today we're going to talk about how cannabis plants can actually accumulate heavy metals. We're going to talk about this recent study that shows that users are, are more prone to having high levels of heavy metals and also what can be done about this. OK, now. Um, one other thing, if you um, haven't already, please um, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Please share it with others, like, do all those types of things. Please become a Patreon member of ours if you want to support this channel where we have our education station and other exclusive information just for our members that otherwise our our uh, patients only would have access to. Okay. Now, as far as the cannabis plant itself, one of the things about it is that it actually scavenges. It binds to heavy metals. It's not just that for pesticides, petroleum, solvents, crude oils as well. So it is actually very easy to contaminate and have tainted cannabis plants. And for a long time, people have been exposed to these things because they had either did not know it was there. They didn't know the sources that they were getting from. They weren't using companies or getting it from places, obviously, on the street. They weren't testing for toxins and making sure that it wasn't making it to market. Now, uh, most plants, if they were exposed to those things, it would kill the plants. But it seems as if the cannabis plants, which is one of the oldest plants in the world, has evolved in a way to be able to handle those types of things. Um, they even seem to be able to thrive in their process. But, uh, you know, the um, these toxins themselves are then passed along to the user if they're using the plant, if it's in the plant. Um, now, it's interesting because, uh, you know, cannabis sativa is both hemp as well as marijuana. So at the medical dispensaries or where when you look on the label, if you look up what what marijuana is, you'll see cannabis sativa. But the same thing for hemp. It's the same genus and species. Now, hemp has actually been grown and used to absorb, to leach toxins. Plants were grown around Chernobyl um, back when there was the, um, the the disaster from the power plant. Um, and they found that it was able to absorb from the soil toxins and all types of things as well. The U.S. Department of, of Agriculture is actually sponsoring research now on how to bioengineer bio the plants um, in order to absorb even greater amounts of the toxins. And because the plant, the, the, the root system grows very linearly and covers very large amounts of space when it's allowed to, that really can impact how soil is, the safety of the soil. And then that can, and then they could, those plants could be removed to then grow other plants in a safer environment. It's, it's pretty cool how they're doing this, but uh, you know, if you can make, make a better environment, better soil for what you're going to grow than those other foods that you may be growing um, to put into your body or that that industries are doing, you may be getting less tainted that way too. Okay, so now as far as this recent study, which I thought was rather fascinating on um, the, so there've been previous studies that have like maybe measured how much heavy metals are in the plants. And that's how they've been able to find that, that it is super absorbers, if you will, of heavy metals. But um, this was the first time where they actually, a study was done that I'm aware of, where they compared users of cannabis and then what their blood and urine levels would show versus people who were never users. And they even broke it down to people who are, are using more recently versus um, longer ago, but still users in order to kind of have an idea of how long is it sticking around for once it's, a, once it's been removed from the body, which is also very important. Now, this particular study, which was done at Columbia University in the Mailman School of Public Health, 
they looked at the blood and urine of 7,254 people, okay? And these were people who said that they had used, um, looking at people who had used cannabis in the last 30 days, specifically to look at the levels of their heavy metal. So there's a couple other things, but that's really what the focus of this particular study was, looking at heavy metals in their bodies to compare. Um, now, part of the issue, though, and one of the, the things that we ding the study on is it did not compare whether people were users of medical cannabis products gotten from dispensaries that hopefully are checking for these types of things versus people who are street users who are getting it from anywhere. And it certainly would have been nice to be able to differentiate between those. Hopefully there will be researchers, which we'll talk a little bit more about why that could potentially be important when we discuss what can be done about all of this. OK, but here's the thing. Those who ingested cannabis in the prior seven days, so within the week, had higher levels compared to people whose last use was further out, but still was in 30 days. OK, now for lead, they found that compared to non-users, marijuana users had 27 percent more lead in their bloodstream, 21 percent higher in their urine, because, of course, we excrete toxins through our urine. Right. So they looked in both compartments. Cadmium was the other one that really got flagged compared to non-users. Marijuana users had 22 percent higher levels in their blood, 18 percent higher in their urine. Now, um, why is that a problem? Well, cadmium itself has been linked to kidney disease and lung cancer in people, but also fetal abnormalities in animals have been identified as well. So obviously doesn't mean that it happened, fetal abnormalities happen in humans, but no one studied that either. But obviously super concerning that it's found in animals when we already know that there are human diseases that are connected with cadmium. So now what can be done? Well, as of May in 2022, which is the last study that I could find, of the 31 states um, that uh, at the time were had um, were legal for um, recreational um, or medical, and they found that 28 of those states actually do have regulations where they're measuring for not just cadmium and lead, but also um, arsenic and mercury. Okay, um, but the thing is, the different states had different limits. There wasn't a um, national standard like the you know we know that um, there are for other things in in foods and levels and blood levels and etc. But when it comes to um to cannabis, there was no set say that if the plant has above X, it needs to be rejected. They have different standards. Okay, um, and of course that means that there's no national standards either. And I think part of that, in all honesty, is because of the controlled one um you know the schedule one of the controlled acts the, um since nobody could study it, nobody could be doing research on how much of these metals are in body because you couldn't just who would be honest to say that. That they actually use and how often they use for when it was a illegal on all standards. So hopefully one of the benefits that will happen from this rescheduling of schedule one to schedule three, which of course, as we've talked about on this channel, means that the federal government has acknowledged finally that there are medical benefits to cannabis. And so research can be done, lots of other benefits, although not complete benefits. I know a lot of people are calling for deregulation. Things happen in steps in government. It took 25 years for um, prohibition to go away in the early 1900s. So it's an important step in the right direction, needs to go more. But I'm hopeful that now that this we will be able to know, you know, what safe levels are in the plants are OK. If there should be a, a, a standard level there. Um, now, I had personally advised my patients, first of all, if if um, testing is being, you know, ask at the dispensaries. Um, I guess you could at smoke shops, too. But of course, um, you know, there's a lot of issues going on with those products because, you know, the state law in Florida does absolutely require that that those four metals be tested for. OK, it's been something there on the books. Thank God they do it. OK, but um, but there could be other levels because, you know, what you want to know is like, you know, especially if it's not from a Florida dispensary, from a smoke shop or for somewhere else, which, again, I'm not condoning that whatsoever. Um, but, you know, find out is independent third party testing or obviously if you're in another state which doesn't have the same rules here. Um, are they doing independent third party testing on every single batch that's made? Not. Yeah, we check every once in a while. Yes, we check for these things, but um. Ask to see it. You want to see it. If they're not willing to show it to you, you have to ask yourself why. Are they not testing? Do they know something that they don't want you to know? Are they not testing enough? But that's a good thing to ask. But if you ask for the last three, what's called certificate of analyses or third-party testing, um, you can see what they're testing for. So not just heavy metals. Are they testing for pesticides? Are they testing for molds? Are they are they testing for other types of chemicals that, that you don't want to be there as well? You can then see by um, seeing not just about the metals, but that other stuff as well as what's showing up on there. OK, um, now also you can see, are they just listing a pass or fail? 
again, depending on what the standard is that they're using, or are they actually losing the numbers? Can you can you actually see, are they just under range, or are they like, nah, there's nothing in there whatsoever, which of course would be the preference of it, but at least you can see, you can see if there's any variability from batch to batch as well to kind of get a better sense of the company, the products that they're making. Now, um, as far as my take on this whole thing, so first of all, I think it's fair to say that, especially if it's contaminated, the more you consume, the more you're going to be exposed. The higher the levels are giving the body. That's just common sense. I guess same thing we do with alcohol and blood alcohol levels, right? Not a, a rocket scientist kind of figuring out about that. Um, it'd be interesting to note, does the geographical um, location matter? You know, uh, um, if, if things are grown during um, um, in more um, remote areas or if they're being in more um, urban areas, you know, might there be a difference? Are they growing it in, gra in the ground or are they growing it hydroponically or in greenhouses where there's more protection from the rain and from um, other toxins and they controlling the environment. That could be an important thing to look at. Um, but there is something, you know, obviously besides checking with dispensaries, making sure you're getting products that have the least amount of toxins. What can you do in order to help your own detoxification system? I know I've talked about things like vitamin D and zinc levels, which help. But not only that, um, you know, there are certain things that we all can take. You know, I take on a daily basis, something called L-glutathione. You may have heard about the body's most important detoxifier. N-acetylcysteine or NAC, which is what needed to make glutathione, but it also has detoxification properties on its own. Been a while since I've talked about MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate um, reductase, which I say to sound smart, which is the enzyme that activates folate, which is super important to produce glutathione naturally in the body in the first place. Other methylation genetic markers as well. We can do things on a regular basis to minimize our toxins, reducing our toxins from other things, eating organic foods, etc. So, you know, kind of like in a toxic bucket, uh, you know, um, we don't want our bucket to overflow, right? We want we want to be able to deal with the toxins that our bodies are exposed to because until we find another planet, we have to accept we're not going to be, um, we're always going to be exposed to toxins. And it, it's really sad, but we can minimize what we're exposed to. We can optimize how we get rid of them in the first place. So hopefully you've learned a thing or two now. Have a great day.